Welcome everybody. My name is John Clay, VP of Threat Intelligence at Trend Micro, and welcome to our episode 16 of Trend Talks BizSec. Joining me again is Ed Cabrera, Chief Cybersecurity Officer. Ed, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. We're going to be talking about the new national cybersecurity strategy. Ed actually is a former U.S. Secret Service agent and was the CISO at the U.S. Secret Service. So Ed has had a lot of experience uh, working in U.S. government and dealing with the strategies over the years. And, and that tees up the first question, Ed. Um, what are some of the main goals of this new cybersecurity strategy that the Biden administration has put out? And maybe how does it differ from some of the past ones that we've seen? Well, I mean, first and foremost, uh, any strategy at this point is a good strategy. Right. And I think what has happened over the years that we've had challenges associated with trying to develop a comprehensive national strategy. And I say national strategy, but it really needs to be a global strategy. And I do really think that the work that was done behind this uh, strategy that was recently released is a step forward. But I almost think it's almost like the first step forward. Uh, I, I think there's a lot more we can do. I think the focus on critical infrastructure and protecting cr critical infrastructure by far is one of the most critical elements of the strategy. But there, there are challenges there. So, I mean, the because let's be honest, we, we talk in terms of 16 critical infrastructure sectors. And so just about everything that we have, <laughs> that we consume, use on a daily basis is considered uh, critical infrastructure. And so, and not all criti critical infrastructure is is the same. So the, the strategy effect, you know, um, uh, creating that priority is one, good. Two, the other is the streamlining of the, uh, or eliminating or limiting the uh, regulatory burden that critical infrastructure has, right? So depending on which sector you sit in, you're really burdened by many different, uh, uh, you know, regulatory compliant um, uh, issues and programs. And so that is a, a cost. And so to be able to keep up with the ongoing and increasing regulatory burden, uh, to different regulatory bodies is one of the main things that I thought was very interesting in incentivizing private industry to do more. Yeah, uh, you know, I, then, I, 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 what I like about this, Ed, is that they do emphasize critical infrastructure. As you said, you know, the U.S., the, the U.S. In, in and of itself is almost run by critical infrastructure. And if we have any issues in, in that industry or in that sector, it's going to cause issues for everybody around, right? And we're also seeing with the Russia-Ukraine where Russia is targeting some of the critical infrastructure in Ukraine. So we already are seeing in real life how critical infrastructure can affect a country. So I do like how they put a big emphasis on critical infrastructure. One of the things that was interesting, you mentioned, you know, streamlining and, and uh, the uh, regulatory stuff, but but that also brings into play the public uh, private partnership. So they, there's a big emphasis also on on dealing and how how uh, the private industry is going to be encompassing into this cybersecurity strategy, this national one you're talking about. How are we going to see that play out? Do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think the public-private partnership is key, and we usually talk about that in terms of uh, enhancing our threat intelligence and information sharing from private sector to government and vice versa. But I think you know it's a two-step process here in in enhancing the public-private partnership. One, which the strategy sort of addresses and 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 speaks to, is this notion of you know 80% of critical infrastructure is owned by the private sector. Right. And so, uh, in other words, get your house in order first. It is um, uh, trying to elevate the security and the risk, uh, managing the risk associated with each of these critical uh, sector owner operators is first and foremost. So you as a public-private uh, partnership member as a private industry is fix your house first. And then I think the next step is is definitely enhancing. And we've seen a lot of progress and Trend Micro has been there at the at the front of it is is enhancing our threat intelligence and information sharing right. uh, upon you know amongst not only government agencies but international law enforcement agencies. I mean the dismantling and disrupting pieces is critical, and we need to do much more than what even you know outlined in the strategy. Uh, and there's opportunities there, but like I said, it's a good first step. 
Yeah, but you know, and you just mentioned something that's part of this new strategy is they say that it's going to seek to disrupt and dismantle threat actors and foster international cooperation. You mentioned earlier that this should be a global thing, right? Because cyber is global, right? Whether we 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 like it or not, there are no borders really in the cyber world, right? Every internet is is borderless. So the to deal with that. Now, I find it interesting that it sounds that sounds to me like they're going to take a more of an offensive approach so that if there's a actor group out there that is targeting our critical infrastructure, are they going to do the hack back? Are they going to try to take down that infrastructure, um, you know, disrupt and dismantle? Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts on that whole area? Well, I think the government has already really staked a claim, especially with regards with defending or assisting in defending Ukraine, right? With the, um, the NSA and Cyber Command have talked about Obviously, not in, in great detail, but the the activities of their hunt forward teams. In other words, yeah. putting teams out there to really identify the threats to critical infrastructure almost before they even get to us is one obviously uh, sort of goal of these teams. I mean, the primary goal is to aid you know Ukraine as much as possible against uh, any and all cyber attacks but so that strategy is already being implemented at some point and so yes being a little bit more aggress aggressive forward leaning is absolutely a must when it comes to any strategy and i think where public private partnership can come in is you know be be open to providing or helping um you know governments across uh, right. the, the world to be able to do that yeah, and I mean, we're already seeing a number of our peers in the industry helping with identifying these nation state actor groups, providing, you know, indicators of compromise, indicators of attack. We're doing the same thing, as you mentioned. We're also providing information to law enforcement, like this U.S. Secret Service, so they're able to go and arrest a lot of these actors. Uh, obviously, um, cyber mercenaries get bring are getting going to be bringing into this area as well. So that'll be an interesting one. But, you know, what's interesting, Ed, is there is a country out there that has a model that seems to be working very well, and that's uh, Israel's Cyberdome strategy. I know you've done some work over there, and so maybe you can help the audience understand a little bit about what they're doing and how does it differ a little bit from, from what the U.S. Uh, uh, cyber strategy is? Yes, absolutely. So Israel, for obvious reasons, uh, has been on a war footing since uh, its existence. And so they approach it from a, a differently than us. And they also have their critical infrastructure um, uh, lined up differently than us. So, but the one key element that we should learn from is they're driving this ecosystem approach where they're providing a centralized approach that allows private industry uh, security vendors to plug in, but uh, to integrate and operate, you know, together in this framework. And so it's, I would say, if you were to look at our strategy and theirs, there's probably, ours is step one, there's step three and four. So to, to be able to strive to that type of protection, I think it, it, it should be a, a primary goal for us, because I think there's elements that we're doing now. We have trusted internet connections for uh, .gov and the, the .mil. And so we can look to, to possibly expanding that for certain critical infrastructure sectors and, and, and doing a lot more at a centralized approach. Uh, arguably, you know, the challenge is it has to be very, uh, you know, has to be done in a very um, mindful manner uh, with private industry, right? Because obviously if 80% of the critical infrastructure is owned by the private industry, there's a lot much more, there's much more uh, concerns about privacy and concerns about control that private sector companies would have. Yeah, I also think, you know, obviously Israel is one country, a uh, smaller country. The U.S. government is very big. It's very broad. There are many, many agencies that are having to deal with this. And so, you know, so trying to centralize all that is is going to be a chance. But like I like you said earlier, I do like the fact with this new cybersecurity strategy, they're trying to streamline, maybe go to a single type of framework. So maybe like the NIST framework, everybody follows that. You know, you have the SEC has already put in place a bunch of stuff for the financial industry, but that's different from maybe the manufacturing industry, which is different from the agricultural. Maybe we need to get a little more centralized in that perspective. You think that would help things? 
No, I, I think exactly the way the strategy sort of sets this goal to streamline the complexity of the regulatory burden that uh, companies face. I think that is definitely something to where it's not so much um, eliminate regulation, it is to streamline it and, and make it easier for critical infrastructure sectors to be able to be compliant and not be so burdensome. So I think it's a fantastic sort of first step on it just devils in the details. What does that look like? How is it done? Because there is so many different um, frameworks out there uh, and unifying them and or streamlining the, the, the compliance component to it would be uh, extremely helpful. Yeah, the hard work's got to start now, right? You can always announce a strategy. Implementing the strategy is the 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 burden that is going to have to happen. So we'll see how this goes. What are, are there any other aspects of this, Ed, that we didn't cover today? Well, I, I think you know the other aspects is which I do think the strategy sort of comes up short, and it is it it, it speaks to it, but doesn't really address the way it should. And I think a lot of it is converged. IT and OT risk that critical infrastructure faces every day. We speak to it, it's it's not something new, uh, but I think from a strategy perspective, I think we need to really take that next step and be the priority for critical infrastructure. And, and it's not just, say, smart factories, we're talking about uh, building automation systems that are becoming much more connected. We have um, transportation systems that are now being connected. You're going to have uh, the smart cities interfacing with smart factories and building automations. So this convergence of, you know, industrial IoT uh, networks and systems with traditional, you know, enterprise IT systems, I think is something that really needs to have a strong focus. And the, and the last one is is the cyber workforce development piece. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, really focusing how do what how do we take um, steps to really fill the, you know, over 3 million vacancies uh, worldwide, but here in the United States, how do we get to that uh, 700,000 vacancies? How do we fill those? And we, the systems are broken and sort of all stovepipe still. We talk a lot about it, but there's not a lot of innovation on, on how do we get more, qualified and exciting young individuals in the industry. Yeah, I think to, to comment on both of those, Ed, first is um, what I like to talk about, and not, not so much ITOT convergence is more ITOT connectiveness. We're connecting these two things, right? OT was never connected to the internet for many, many years because of the requirements of it, but now they're having to be connected. And so that connectiveness is what's causing a lot of these challenges for a lot of businesses and, and especially critical infrastructure, because most of critical infrastructure has OT networks out there. So, you know, our TX1 and our VIC1 and some of these, these subsidiaries of Trend Micro are really looking to put in place the security frameworks and, and, and solutions for that. Um, for that area, on the on the workforce thing, what's what is good news from my perspective, Ed, is you mentioned eighty percent of our of our uh, critical infrastructure is private. Private can pay better because I know government always has a challenge with paying these you know individuals. So the good news, I think, you know, hopefully pay scales are better in the in the private sector than they are in the public sector, so that uh, we can recruit some of these people. But I think the big part in this area is the education system needs to improve, right? We need to get the programs to be able to train these people properly to come into the workforce. Obviously, when you and I started in cybersecurity, there was no, there were no classes, there were no courses in it. We had to learn as we go. The good news is now there is some frameworks, there's some courses, there's organizations that can, that can train people up from a young age. And even our, you know, our, um, Internet safety for kids and family. We're already getting into the classrooms and when they're in preschool and and uh, elementary school, and we're teaching these kids how to become good digital citizens. So hopefully that helps in the future. There's, but there's there's a lot of I mean there is hope. Uh, the Department of Defense just released its cyber workforce strategy. The White House is expected to release a broader cyber workforce strategy, okay. but it's just the hopes that we can create and eliminate barriers, not only on the education piece, but also how do you know, individuals in the private sector possibly do uh, and work 
uh, almost as cyber reserves. There was a bill that was right. passed in the last Congress. It just didn't make it all the way through, but it was uh, DHS was pushing a cyber reserve, a civilian reserve component. So these are the, the sort of the innovation pieces that we really need to see yeah. from our strategy, our national strategy, because without it, we're just going to be stovepiped. And, and then you're going to have the mind share in government fleeing to higher paying jobs in private industry. And it's really not doing the right thing for our national uh, defense. Perfect. And this has been a great discussion. I really appreciate uh, the insights you've given. Like I said, your, your years of experience with the U.S. government, I think, lends itself well in this. So uh, great discussion. Everybody, thanks for joining our episode 16 of Trend Talks BizSec. We'll be back in a couple of weeks to talk on another subject. Ed, have a great day. We'll talk soon. You too. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.